Hey guys, so um, I'm Fawad Halim. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Mono. Uh, so show of hands, uh, how many people know about Mono or .NET and stuff? Everyone? Okay, I can just go home. Seriously? Yeah, everyone knows about Mono? Beautiful. All right, um, so, um, so for those who don't know about Mono and .NET or one of the two, um, um, the uh, .NET is kind of Microsoft's name for um, uh, runtime and a bunch of libraries that go with it. So the runtime is called the CLR, the Common Language Runtime, and there are a bunch of libraries that they ship with that uh, platform, and the whole bundle of uh, the compiler, the runtime, the languages, the details of how the code goes from text form to bytecode to actually run on a machine. That whole thing is the Microsoft name, um, code name, or uh, brand name, .NET. Um, Mono is not .NET. It is um, an implementation of the CLR, uh, the Common Language Runtime, uh, that is very portable. And it does the same things, but it's not a .NET. So, um, this is just a picture I stole off of Wikipedia that kind of shows how um, .NET works. So um, there is source code like you have in Python, right? Uh, text files that go through a compiler that uh, get turned into this bytecode uh, um, in a format called the Common Intermediate Language. Um, so basically, when you compile a .NET program, it gets turned into files that either have uh, an extension of .exe or .dll, those are in this format, the common intermediate language format. Uh, they share those extensions with uh, native dot, uh, Windows applications. They are not the same thing. So a Windows .exe is not exactly the same thing as a, um, a .NET or a CLR .exe. And similarly, the DLR, uh, DLLs are not the same thing. They just have the same extension. So um, it's easy to get confused, but they're very different. Um, and the key thing being is uh, uh, this, uh, the DLLs and EXEs that are generated from um, CLR languages are portable. So they are not specific to the platform that you're running on. So they do not contain Intel code. They're just abstract code like uh, Java byte code is. And then uh, finally at the bottom, you have the common language runtime right here. So that's the part that takes that bytecode and turns it into machine code and actually executes it. So it, uh, there is a there's an actual compiler that turns it into machine code. There is a runtime that takes care of allocating memory and um, getting rid of memory and moving stuff around and uh, trampolining between uh, things. So that's all the common language runtime. And finally, you've got the machine code at the bottom. So um, uh, why was Mono created? So a, a very common misconception people have is Mono is supposed to be a clone of .NET. And that's not the case. And at, at least it wasn't the case when I was uh, involved with it uh, like seven or eight years ago. Um, the, so when Microsoft uh, kind of announced .NET in 2002 or so, um, this guy, uh, Miguel Diacaza, he was working on um, a bunch of applications to run on Linux and Unix-like systems. So he worked on, uh, he was working at a company called um, um, Helix Code that became um, uh, Zimian, uh, which got bought out by Novell, which became, um, what's it called now? Z Xamarin, thank you. So, um, so his intention was that okay, there's this really nicely packed out stack of things that I can use to create uh, these open source Linux applications. So right now I'm working against C and I'm spending a lot of time on it. Why not just uh, implement something that'll make it easier for me to develop .NET applications or uh, applications on Linux? So his original motivation was about a kind of getting a very quick turnaround for applications uh, 
on the GNOME stack in Linux. So things like uh, evolution and I don't know what ap other applications again in mind. Uh, but I know what's there, but I don't know what you're thinking about. Yeah, I know. It turns out very differently, right? Uh, so I don't think I don't think evolution uses uh, .NET, right? No, I think Banshee and uh, Tomboy are the right. main two that I know of. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a perfectly good platform. So um, a whole bunch of uh, he, uh, the original team kind of ported a whole bunch of things. They implemented a C, C sharp compiler in C sharp. Uh, so they bootstrapped off of .NET. They created their own uh, compiler and made it as uh, kind of brought it in line with how the Microsoft C sharp compiler was working until. There came a point where their C sharp compiler could compile their own C sharp compiler, so it became self-hosting, and uh, I mean it kind of evolved from there. So it's like a pretty long history. The project has been around for, I would say, seven or eight years, um, more than that. Uh, I think the 1.0 release was in 2004, and um, it kind of, um, uh, like I said, it's because it's not not .NET. It doesn't have the exact feature set of .NET, so there are. Uh, I'll talk about uh, things that are same and different between um, Mono and .NET. But in in general, like the language is the exact same, and um, uh, a lot of the core libraries are the same. But it's not the exact same thing as .NET. So um, uh, when Microsoft released uh, the .NET uh, specs, they actually released a whole bunch of things uh, to the standard committees, um, which included the C# -sharp language. They uh, standardized the common language. I can't remember what the I stands for, but it was infrastructure. Thank you. So um, um, the common language infrastructure, which included a whole bunch of details about how your text code uh, gets turned into byte code. Uh, so it's very, very well spec'd out. It's very detailed. Uh, you can go to the ECMA websites and actually pop those documents if you are interested. And then they actually use standardize a couple of uh, very core libraries uh, in the .NET runtime. So there, those all the things are all part of the standard documentation that Microsoft um, released. And they have a very permissive license. They have patent uh, grants and stuff. So they're very, very safe to use in open source applications. Um, so, uh, in terms of .NET compatibility, um, there is a web page that you can go to that'll kind of give you an idea about um, how compatible Mono is to .NET. Um, I cached that page here, so as to be able to show you. Um, um, so it talks about features that are in um, is that big enough to for to see? Okay, cool. So um, it talks about features that are in uh, the .NET environment um, that are in Mono or might not be in Mono. So as you can see, um, like if you're familiar with um, developing on .NET and you're doing web applications and um, you're doing your standard talking to a database, you're uh, doing uh, collection uh, uh, manipulation and all that good stuff. That stuff is all there. Um, Things that are, that are not there are usually things that are so insanely complicated for, but for so little value that nobody bothered to port them. Because honestly, like the community around Mono is pretty large, so a lot of people actually just pick up stuff and implement it and contribute it to Mono. But there are things that nobody bothered to do it just because there was not enough interest or it was just insanely complicated. So things like WPF, it's a um, a GUI library that Microsoft came out with in the .NET 3.0 timeframe. Um, it's uh, widely considered to be insanely complicated, not only to uh, implement, but just to use. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very complicated library. So nobody actually bothered to port it. Um, and then there is this um, WCF communication library. It's kind of uh, ported, but again, it's a it's a pretty huge uh, spec, so uh, nobody bothered to implement the whole thing in Mono. But uh, I would say for, um, if you're doing things like web applications or 
um, older uh, desktop applications like Windows Forms and stuff, uh, there's a pretty good chance that things will just work. So you can just compile them in uh, Windows and copy the assemblies over to um, Linux, and they will mostly just work. OK, so things like um, database access, uh, Windows Forms uh, mostly works now. Um, just kind of uh, sad because uh, people don't use Windows Form a whole lot anymore. Um, uh, there are things that um, Mono does that you don't find in .NET. So first of all, it's open source. It's The whole stack is open source. It's got um, a GPL license on the compiler. Stuff around the compiler is LGPL, but then everything else is MIT licensed. So if you find something that's interesting, you can feel free to take that code, put it in your .NET application, and not contribute back if you want to. So uh, the whole stack is open source. It's very portable. Um, got a very nice t-shirt from the Mono project that says, how portable is your .NET? And it's got this gigantic list of platforms that Mono runs on. So it runs on, I would say, any um, uh, modern platform that you can think of. So it runs on uh, the Intel platforms, Spark, ARM, uh, the S390. I don't even know what that is. It's, uh, the, I just know that it works there. Uh, IBM mainframe. Yes, uh, uh, it is. Uh, I've just never seen it. Uh, <laughs> So it is extremely portable, and there are um, there are very various levels of portability. So um, um, due to the way the project evolved, um, it actually is portable to different degrees. Uh, so if your platform is so esoteric that nobody's actually written a just-in-time compiler for it, Mono actually includes an interpreter, um, so you can run it uh, like you. Uh, run Python applications. Uh, and that interpreter just turns that um, a, a code that usually would be just in time compiled and executed as if it was native code into uh, interpreted code. Um, so, And um, the JIT itself has been uh, ported over to a, a pretty large number of platforms. Uh, there is a C sharp REPL. So Python guys uh, probably don't even consider that a feature. but uh, uh, C sharp does not have a REPL, uh, as far as I know. Uh, a REPL is a read, evaluate, uh, print loop. So uh, a shell, yeah. So you, you type Python, enter, and then you can type print space blah, and it runs right away, right? Uh, big feature on the .NET side. Um, uh, it's, um, it's coming up uh, in C sharp, as far as I know. It's, uh, I think it might. Uh, get implemented in 20 in Visual Studio 2012 or maybe later, um, uh, but it's in uh, Mono for a, a quite a while now. Um, it, um, like I said, it's got an interpreted mode. It's got support for bundling, uh, and which is really convenient for a lot of reasons. It has uh, so, uh, like I described, uh, applications that you write get uh, combined compiled down to. IL. So pretty much every module that you write gets compiled down to IL, right? Um, and that's usually the case for .NET applications as well. In a lot of cases, uh, you don't want to distribute it like these 20 files and have this bootstrapper that starts up your application. And uh, so it's kind of a pain. So um, Mono supports what's called bundling. And um, uh, uh, so it, uh, fat jar, exactly fat jar. Um, so it uh, it can start with your application, walk the dependency graph, and pull all of those things into one big executable. And um, I think there is a, a support for including a bootstrapper in there. So you can actually get an executable that includes all your dependencies and a, a mono runtime to go with it. So you just get this gigantic executable that does not depend on anything other than your libc, yeah. uh, which is brilliant, right? Um, but then it actually goes a step further. Um, so um, I'm not really familiar with um, 
uh, these two products, but uh, this new company, uh, Xamarin, uh, produces uh, um, an implementation for Mono for Android and for iOS. And um, so um, if you've developed with iOS, which I have not, uh, you'd uh, know that uh, they have very strict um, policies about what you can do uh, in your application that gets deployed on the iOS platform. So uh, it includes um, not being able to uh, generate code. It does not want you to pull in code from outside. And uh, the, as it turns out, things like Python and uh, Java and .NET rely heavily on being able to generate code at runtime. Um, these two products, Mono, Mono Touch for sure, and I think Monodroid as well, kind of uh, take this whole um, uh, application that usually would be um, a jitted application and does an ahead of time comp compilation and generates ARM binaries that you can deploy on your uh, iPhone or Android devices, which is brilliant. And uh, there are um, a whole bunch of applications on the marketplaces that are written in those uh, um, platforms. Uh, those two products are not open source. The core mono is open source. It's just the, the, the bits that um, uh, do code generation from mono assemblies to um, Android and iOS applications, those are not open source. Um, they are very cheap, though. Uh, they're like $200 each uh, or something around those lines. So uh, they're insanely cheap, and uh, the productivity boost that you would get over something like Objective-C is just ridiculous. Uh, and um, uh, th um, their UI uh, um, philosophy is that they don't want to do the thing that Java did with um, uh, uh, I'm totally blanking out on their UI technology. Swing. Swing, yes, thank you. Swing and AWT. Uh, so instead of re rewriting um, a widget toolkit that um, looks alien on every platform, they said, okay, we'll um, give you bindings for your underlying platform. So if you're... Um, it's the more SWT, so. uh, Like SWT, exactly. Um, so they kind of bring those UI toolkits that you have available on your platforms and they expose them to your .NET applications, and um, it, they make it very convenient to use from .NET applications. So if you're uh, an iOS developer, you are probably doing Cocoa um, uh, development, right? Um, the, the way you bind widgets together in Cocoa are, is very different from how event handlers work in .NET role. Monos, uh, the products that Xamarin provides um, kind of, um, let you work with those widgets as if they were uh, widgets on the applications that are, or the toolkits that are native on .NET. And I'm, I'm not getting paid to say this. I'm just, uh, I just love their products, honestly. So, um, oh, what, is the, uh, what do these things have to do with Python? So, um, as it turns out that um, Mono actually is a very solid foundation for running your languages. Uh, uh, whether you're running a dynamically typed language or a statically typed language, uh, Mono is a very nice um, uh, foundation where you can host your applications. So um, there is an implementation of Python on Mono called, um, or on the CLR called uh, Iron Python. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples on uh, showing you how C sharp applications talk to uh, Python and the other way around. Um, and because uh, they're sitting on top of Mono, you get uh, access to libraries that uh, uh, you get from Mono as well as um, kind of uh, these nice um, 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 compatibility features uh, within the CLR. So uh, uh, if you're a, a Python developer and you're kind of wanna, you've got this piece of code that really needs to run fast, you usually have to get down to the C types level, right? Uh, you uh, write your uh, code in C and you uh, create a C types wrapper and you call that. Well, um, with um, Iron Python, you get this additional layer right between the machine and uh, your Python code where you can um, write this performance critical code in C sharp 
or a statically type, uh, other statically type language uh, and leverage that um, uh, facility. So um, why would you want to use Iron Python? So um, if you're a Python developer, it's just Python, uh, honestly. Like it's, um, uh, um, so Boo looks very like Python, but it's, uh, like it takes uh, parts of Python, looks, uh, it takes the looks of Python, but then it pulls in things you require from C Sharp to make it statically typed and performant. Uh, Iron Python does not do that. Iron Python is real Python, so things are truly portable. Of course, uh, that comes with baggage, right? Uh, your stuff is not statically typed, so it's going to be slow, and things are going to explode at runtime. Um, so that might or might not be a good thing. Um, you get access to the .NET um, libraries, and there are a whole lot of them. And if you're a .NET developer who's um, doing C Sharp applications in your day job, um, a lot of times um, you have a need for scripting your application. You've got this nicely uh, refactored performant core, but then your users have to write .NET code and compile it and uh, 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 run it against that thing. Well, Iron Python gives you a very nice um, entry point into that code. So um, you can write your core in C Sharp and then write your driver application, as it were, in Python. How much time do I have? All right. Um, so um, let me show you a couple of quick examples. So, um, uh, that's Mono Develop. It's um, an IDE um, running on top of uh, Mono. It's written in GTK Sharp, which is like so. Like I said, uh, they are very good about exposing things that are uh, useful in your underlying uh, platforms. So uh, on Linux. Um, the GTK toolkit is the toolkit that you use to write um, GUI applications. So th they kind of um, took this um, um, ID called Sharp Develop and ported it to um, uh, Mono. And it, it's a pretty decent ID as far as IDs go. So it's got debugging and uh, 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 profiling and unit testing and all, all that good stuff. So um, to give you a little of, a little bit of context, I am going to show you how um, C sharp application can call out to a Python script. So I have this very silly Python that says, "This is the list of assemblies that are loaded." So assemblies are uh, just to jog your memory are uh, those uh, units of bytecode that get generated when you compile stuff down to um, the .NET IL level. So this just um, uh, does a list comprehension on the set of assemblies uh, that are loaded and generates a string and prints them. So this C Sharp application creates uh, a, uh, an, uh, a scripting engine instance. So, um, so if, if uh, for the .NET uh, people, um, Scripting applications kind of uh, have a very different approach for handling scopes and stuff. So, um, uh, for example, um, C Sharp doesn't have global, like not honest to goodness, goodness global, right? Python does. So you need a way to contain, uh, or a, a more generally, uh, a way to bridge your dynamically typed world with your statically typed world. So. Um, now what do you uh, do in uh, the DLR, the dynamic language runtime that sits on top of the .NET runtime, is you create a scripting engine, which basically says spin up a, a, a tiny instance of Python inside my application, create a scope for it. Uh, so that gives you the uh, container for executing things. Load this, iron, uh, this Python application in that scope and then execute it. All right, and this, I need to figure out how to increase the size of this. I, I don't think I can. 
Uh, sucks to uh, I don't think I can. So I'll just. Uh, the the bigger problem is I can't resize the font on this thing. I think I have to. Oh, you can see it. Sweet. All right. So um, so this line of code came from the C sharp um, application, but then this line came from the Python code. So C sharp started up an application, handed off control to Python, and said, "Go." Python sees that it's loaded these two assemblies. So there's a core library and a system library. It sees those assemblies and it says, I, I can see them. It sets the message, which was that same string. C Sharp is able to read uh, that message from the Python scope and say, hey, I see this string as well. Does the scope contain like the Python path and stuff? Uh, I don't know. I uh, I think you can set it up, but I. In fact, I, it, it does. Uh, it I, it might not. Be, it's probably not the C Python Python path, but there is a Python path. Okay. Uh, uh, so you can get out of the stuff, stuff. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I have an example that shows you that. So uh, uh, the uh, kind of skimmed over it, but um, there's a uh, the set of libraries sitting on top of the .NET runtime called the Dynamic Language Runtime. It's a very um, confusing name because it's not really a runtime. It's more of like these common libraries that you would require to bridge uh, static language with languages with dynamic languages. And so it uh, includes things like being able to uh, take snippets of code that run at a call site and take the generated code from there and kind of cache it and uh, uh, get at the AST for things. Um, so uh, it's common stuff that a lot of uh, dynamic languages do. Uh, they refactor those into the DLR, and they have a um, uniform way of accessing those things. So if you were doing, let's say, an um, Iron Ruby application, you you would pretty much swap out this part with uh, the corresponding um, Iron Ruby engine incantation, and you would have a .rb file here. But the rest of it, uh, the rest of your interaction would remain the same. Which kind of makes it very nice to do, uh, kind of have your C sharp applications be oblivious to the language that it's talking to. So next, I've got an example of how, as a C sharp developer, Python might be useful. So uh, if you've got a very s silly little plugin uh, system where you hit, each plugin just has one method, call execute, and you don't care where that pl plugin came from as long as you can see it. Uh, you can write those plugins in Python. Um, so uh, what I'm doing next is I'm saying load this assembly, and I'm saying execute the script that's sitting in a plugin.py. A plugin.py uh, imports that um, namespace that I had my C sharp code in. It creates a class that extends that interface. So I mean. Um, Python doesn't have interfaces, right? It's been a while. Be a Zilf library. Right, but not like proper interfaces, right? <laughs> uh, that's what I thought. So, um, but, uh, so this interface kind of pretends to be a class. Um, and you extend that, and you implement the method in it. So this, I mean, it's not at all useful, but it uh, kind of uh, shows you that you can uh, implement uh, logic um, in Python that you can call from C Sharp. So the, this kind of gives you a more uh, controlled way of executing C Sharp uh, or Python code from C Sharp. So uh, what I'm saying here is um, load this file, execute it. And as you can see, it says registering a plugin. So it basically loaded this file, and as you know, um, you've got this, uh, uh, these two statements outside of the class. So these will get loaded, ex uh, ex executed as, as soon as your file gets loaded. So it says registering a plugin, and it actually registered an instance of this class with my plugin manager, which again is just um, it's a very um, silly class that just keeps a list of plugins that it knows about. And then I can say 
for each plugin that I know about called the execute method in there. And of course, uh, this plugin um, is um, an Iron Python plugin. I, I say execute. And we, when we go back to the output, why does it not scroll? Oh crap, okay. <laughs> Something bad happened here. Uh, sorry, this is working. Oh, um, was this supposed to return something? I don't, yeah, I geez, should not have messed around with this thing. Yay, okay, um, 